Medieval and Renaissance music presents a number of problems to those interested in historically informed performance. Music manuscripts generally include very few indications as to how they were performed, and it is sometimes not clear if a work was intended for vocal performance, instrumental performance, or a combination of the two. There are also very few extant instruments and treatises that inform us about the training of players and the use of individual instruments. The purpose of this paper is to explore the performance practices of one of the most prominent instrumental ensembles of the 15th century, the Alta Ensemble. Iconography and written documents indicate that the early Alta Ensemble, from approximately 1380 to 1400, was usually a trio consisting of various arrangements of shalms, trumpets, bagpipes, and or drums. Shortly after the turn of the 15th century, the use of bagpipes and drums faded away, and from approximately 1430 to 1500, the Alta standard configuration was two shalms and a slide trumpet. Other instrumentations found less frequently include two or three shams without the trumpet, or late in the 15th century, shams and trombone. There is much debate among scholars regarding issues related to the Alta ensemble. Some believe that the musicians of the Alta extemporized the music they played, and that this music often included counterpoint that did not follow the polyphonic conventions of the written music of the time. Others believe the Alta musicians were capable of following these conventions. Another topic of debate is the existence of a trumpet with a slide mechanism before the 17th century. While most scholars agree that this instrument existed by the late 14th century, there is not unanimous agreement. In order to understand the performance practices of the Alta ensemble in the late 14th and 15th centuries, it is necessary to consider both the Alta's function in society and the capabilities of the instruments involved. I will first brief, briefly discuss the instruments followed by their function and possible methods of performance. At appropriate places within the paper and following the paper, we will perform various repertoire that might have been played by the early 15th century ensemble. Unfortunately, there are no pre-16th pre century shams, nor are there any brass instruments equipped with a slide from this time. Therefore, it is necessary to rely on iconography, musical sources, modern reproductions of early instruments, and historic written documents, such as letters, treatises, and court records, when exploring the instruments and their functions prior to the 16th century. The shawm is a double reed instrument with seven finger holes. In approximately 1487, Johannes Tinctoris wrote in his De Invenzione et Uzu Musicae that any composition can be played on the shawm and that the seventh hole, that is the lowest hole, is not aligned with the other holes because the little finger is generally not long enough to cover it if it were aligned. The holes that are below the finger holes are vent holes which allow the shawm to have a long bow without the pitch of the instrument being lower than desired. Tinctoris also explains that sham players use instruments of various sizes. Small shams are suitable for superior parts, and larger shams, commonly called bombards, are suitable for tenor and contratenor parts. The bombard, also a double reed instrument, is longer than the sham and has a key to cover the lowest hole. This key is covered by a protective barrel. And you can. Thank you. The word shawm is sometimes used in a general manner to indicate both the small shawm and the larger bombard. To avoid confusion between the two instruments, I will only use the term shawm in a general sense when referring to the work of others who have done so. In such a case, I will make this clear. In all other cases, the word shawm will be used in a specific manner to refer to the relatively small instrument suitable for superior parts. In Michael Pretorius' Syntagma Musicum of 1619, he states that the range of the shawm is from D to B, and that the bombard sounds a fifth lower with a range from G to D. Studies of iconography and music indicate this would also have been the ranges of the earlier shams and bombards. Praetorius recommends that when the shawm and bombard are used in performance, the music should be transposed into G for the instruments to have the best sound. This has led scholars to believe that the Alta Ensemble generally followed this practice. Some modern performers and scholars believe that any piece of music 
may have been played by the Alta Ensemble if it lay in the range of the Alta instruments or can be transposed there. Other evidence that supports the argument for transposition is found in Martin Agricola's treatise of 1529 titled Musica Instrumentalis Deutsch, in which he wrote the ranges of the Scham and Bombard a fifth lower than Praetorius did. Agricola gave the lowest notes, note of the Scham as G instead of D, and the lowest note of the Bombard as C instead of G. It is highly likely that the pitches given by Agricola are written pitches only and not the sounding pitches of the instruments. Deductions based on iconography suggest strongly that shams and bombards were not constructed with sufficient length to produce the tones Agricola gives. Furthermore, there are practical limitations to the length of the keyless sham. As has been mentioned, the instrument designed to sound D as its lowest pitch must have the lowest hole set out of alignment with the other holes so that it may be covered with the little finger. If the sham were built long enough to sound the G indicated by Agricola, it would be impossible for a player's fingers to reach all the holes, and a key would therefore be needed to cover the bottom hole, as is the practice on the bombard. Also, since numerous extant 15th century superiors and tenor parts are written in the ranges as given by Agricola, scholars argue Praetorius's notes are the sounding pitches of the instruments and the ranges where the music would have been transposed to. Music manuscripts also suggest that a piece can be transposed. Some compositions are found in different keys in various sources. In the case of two anonymous settings of Je Prie Amour, for instance, one is the fifth higher than the other. Another indication of transposition is found in the Augsburg Lieder book, which contains a section of dances that have been linked to Alta Ensemble performers. Some of these pieces are found in other sources with notes that would be too low for the Alta instruments. These specific notes have been modified in the Augsburg Lieder book to fit the ranges of the Alta instruments. All of these works must be transposed up a fifth to suit the ranges of the Shaman Bombard as given by Praetorius. We will now play A Madame Plaisant et Belle transposed into the ranges of the instruments as given by Praetorius.
Iconography of the Middle Ages shows that trumpets were straight instruments and that they were made in various lengths. In the last quarter of the 14th century, S-shaped trumpets begin to appear in iconography, and within the first quarter of the 15th century, the S-shaped instrument was folded into the looped shape that has lasted to the present day. Here you can see that even on modern trumpets with the addition of valves, the basic loop shape has been retained. To understand the slide trumpet used in the early 15th century Alta Ensemble, one must first have an understanding of the other trumpet in use at the time. Modern scholars have agreed to refer to this instrument as the natural trumpet to differentiate it from all other trumpets in use today. The natural trumpet used through the Baroque era was in the simplest sense a metal tube with a mouthpiece at one end and a flared bell at the other. The instrument is made to sound by the, by the vibration of a player's lips. Through training and practice, one can learn to adjust the tension of the lips and thereby produce various notes. A trumpet with no mechanism to shorten or lengthen the instrument while playing will produce the notes of only one harmonic series. The length of the instrument determines the first note of this series, which is called the fundamental. Regardless of the actual pitch of the first note, the structure of the harmonic series does not change. That is, the succession of intervals between notes in the series remains constant. A trumpet approximately eight feet long, such as this one, has the note C as its fundamental. Therefore, it is referred to as a C trumpet and will produce the notes of the harmonic series beginning on C. This trumpet is therefore of little use in music outside of the key of C. The notes that can be played on it in the range used by the alto trumpeter are shown here. To play other notes, it is necessary to have a trumpet of a different length. A trumpet approximately seven feet long, such as this one, has D as the fundamental and is referred to as a D trumpet. It will sound these pitches in the range used by the alto trumpeter. As you can see, the relationship of each note to the next is the same in both series. The slide trumpet was developed near the beginning of the 15th century and has a long tube inserted in the first yard of the instrument which allows the player to change the length of the trumpet while playing. The player must use one arm to control the mouthpiece and inner slide while the other arm moves the body of the trumpet. The trumpet becomes a chromatic instrument by employing more than one harmonic series. For example, without extending the slide, the notes playable on the D slide trumpet are the same as those playable on the D natural trumpet. By extending the slide approximately five inches, the notes of the D-flat harmonic series are playable. By extending to a third slide position, the notes of the C harmonic series are playable.
and by extending to a fourth position, the notes of the B harmonic series are playable. By combining these four harmonic series, the slide trumpet in D is a chromatic instrument from low F sharp, one half step lower than the lowest note playable on the bombard. The B flat in parentheses is not found in any of the four harmonic series playable on the slide trumpet in D. However, a trumpet player is able to play the B flat by manipulating the pitch of the B natural through a technique referred to as bending a note. With this range and chromatic capability, the trumpet could function as the contratenor instrument of the early 15th century alta ensemble, particularly when taking into account the group's general practice of transposing the music to a higher pitch. Other keys for the slide trumpet have been suggested. In 1950, German musicologist Kurt Sox, one of the founders of organology and an authority on musical instruments, suggested that the trumpet of the alta ensemble was shorter than the D trumpet. In his article, Chromatic Trumpets in the Renaissance, he states that trumpets in the Middle Ages were usually built in F. Due to the short length of this instrument, it is possible to play five different harmonic series. Therefore, these are the notes playable on the slide trumpet in F. In 1989, Ross Duffin, in his article, The Trompette de Menestrel in the 15th century Alta Capella, states that because of the ranges of the Shaman Bombard, a D slide trumpet or the smaller G slide trumpet were the preferred sizes in the Alta Ensemble. The small G trumpet also has five positions. Therefore, these are the notes playable on the instrument. When comparing the pitches available on the instruments in D, F, and G, we see that all three would provide a trumpeter with the notes necessary to play the contratenor parts in the Alta Ensemble. In spite of the evidence that suggests the use of an F or G trumpet, including the fact that the smaller instrument would be physically easier to play, modern manufacturers are reproducing slide trumpets in D, possibly because the trumpet in D is missing only the B flat in the range most common for the contratenor parts, while the trumpet in F is missing both G and F sharp, and the trumpet in G is missing A and G sharp. Also, the longer D trumpet is useful for slide trumpet parts in the Baroque era as well, and the only extant slide trumpet, dated 1651, is in D. In Peter Downey's article, The Renaissance Slide Trumpet, Fact or Fiction, published in 1984, he questions the existence of the slide trumpet in the 15th century and suggests the instrument did not exist until the middle of the 17th century. He argues that there is no evidence to prove the existence of the slide trumpet and that the trumpet used in the Alta Ensemble was a natural trumpet. Since the publication of Downey's article, scholars such as Ross Duffin, Keith Polk, and Herbert Myers have written articles implying that while it is true that there are no documents that prove the existence of the slide trumpet, there are many documents that when considered together strongly suggest the existence of the instrument by the beginning of the 15th century. The majority of Alta Ensemble iconography shows that the trumpet player holds the instrument in a manner consistent with the presence of a slide. This includes the mouthpiece held with one hand and the body of the instrument held at a downward angle with the other hand. In experiments with a modern reproduction of the slide trumpet, I have found this downward angle necessary for the performance of the alto contratenor parts, which sometimes require the player to move the trumpet approximately 15 inches quickly. The downward angle gives a player the ability to move the instrument a greater distance in a shorter period of time than if the trumpet were held more parallel to the ground. When holding the trumpet downward, it is possible to hold the weight of the instrument with my left hand and let gravity pull the trumpet along the slide. My right hand then does not have to hold the trumpet, it only stops the body of the instrument from falling and pulls it back in. 
This playing position also reduces movement where the mouthpiece touches a player's embouchure. Downey suggests that this manner of holding the trumpet was normal and that natural trumpets were held this way. To support his claim, he gives this iconography. These images obviously show a similar manner of holding the trumpet. However, the angle of the instrument is much more like that seen in iconography that shows natural trumpets being held with one hand. While no iconography can prove the existence of a slide trumpet because a still image cannot show motion, it also cannot disprove its existence. Downey's next argument is based on 15th century music manuscripts that include parts labeled trompetum, ad modem tube, contratenor trompetta, and other similar phrases. He attempts to prove that the slide trumpet did not exist in the 15th century by proving that these parts were not intended to be played on the trumpet. This is, however, a weak argument because those who believe the slide trumpet did exist in the 15th century also believe that the parts mentioned by Downey were not intended to be played on the trumpet. Herbert Myers wrote that theorists of the time defined such a part as one imitative of trumpets, not as one performed upon trumpets, and that actual performance of this repertory upon slide trumpets at anything near a feasible pitch for the vocal parts presents extreme technical problems. However, the existence of the slide trumpet and the performance of trompetum parts on it are really two separate issues, and doubt about trompetum parts being intended for performance on the trumpet should not create doubt about the existence of the slide trumpet. Downey then asserts that these parts contain the characteristic motion of the natural trumpet and are therefore in imitation of the natural trumpet. Ross Duffin argues that because both the natural trumpet and the slide trumpet make use of the harmonic series, it is impossible to know that these parts are not in imitation of the slide trumpet. Downey does not address any of the contratenor parts that the other authors have argued are appropriate for the early 15th century alta ensemble. Such pieces, which will be played now, include untext untexted compositions found in the manuscript Trent 87, Oxe Bonior, and Tandernach, and Alopt and Rhine. Both of these pieces work well for the ranges of the Alta instruments. Downey also does not address why the Alta ensemble would have continued using a natural trumpet which was not capable of playing parts in the contrapuntal style of the time.
Numerous iconographic sources showing the Alta Ensemble have survived and proved to be a very useful tool when exploring the function and instruments of the ensemble. This evidence is strengthened by court and city records that frequently include payments to shawm players and a trumpet player. For example, in 1386, a bishop visiting the court of Burgundy brought with him shawm players and a trumpeter. In 1411, the Duke of Burgundy played, paid three shawm players and one trumpeter, and in 1422, this group became a regularly employed ensemble at the court of Burgundy. There are also records of instruments being purchased together. For example, in 1423, the court of Burgundy purchased two shawms, three bombards, and one trumpet. Iconography shows that the common instrumentation of the late 14th and 15th century Alta Ensemble is a trio consisting of shawm, bombard, and slide trumpet. However, the instrumentation can vary. Duos appear on rare occasions, and to my knowledge, no groups larger than four members exist. Regardless of the number of instruments, the ensembles consist of either all shams, all bombards, shams and slide trumpet, bombards and slide trumpet, or a mixture of all three instruments. However, it seems there is never more than one slide trumpet in the ensemble. One of the most extensive studies of Alta Ensemble iconography is Edmund Bowles's iconography as a tool for examining the loud consort in the 15th century. This includes a study of 190 illuminated manuscript pages that date from 1380 to 1500. Smaller studies of other types of iconography from this time have been done as well, and they concur with Bowles' findings. In his study, he uses the word shawm to indicate both the shawm and the bombard. Therefore, when presenting his findings, I will use the general meaning of the word as well. His study shows that the most common instrumental consort trio from 1380 to 1500 is two shams and slide trumpet, and the most common quartet is three shams and slide trumpet. In several of the quartets, however, one sham player is shown not playing. This has led many scholars to believe that these groups are trios with an extra shamist to play when one of the others becomes fatigued. Raymond Burkhart suggests that the possibility of one of these players was an apprentice, no records have been found that indicate how a student learned the art, art of alta ensemble playing. However, if they learn by apprenticing with a master alta performer, it is possible that to gain experience, the student played in alta ensembles with their teacher. This and other iconographical evidence shows that the alta ensemble was employed to perform indoors for dance accompaniment and banquet entertainment, and that they were employed to perform outdoors for garden entertainment, processions, and tournaments. It also shows that the Alta Ensemble consisted of shams, bombards, and slide trumpets almost exclusively until late in the 15th century when the trombone was introduced. It is not known when or where the trombone first appeared. However, the earliest iconographic evidence of the instrument is dated no earlier than 1488, and the earliest extant trombone is dated 1551. The instrument differs from the slide trumpet in that the trombone has a double slide. Therefore, to make the trombone five inches longer, the player need only extend the slide by two and a half inches. The double slide design, as well as the instrument extending backwards over the player's shoulder, makes it possible for the trombone to be much longer and have more slide positions than the slide trumpet. A player is therefore able to play the trombone chromatically more than an octave lower than is possible on the slide trumpet. It is widely agreed that the primary function of the Alta Ensemble was to play music for dancing. There are, however, very few extant ensemble pieces that seem to be intended specifically for use with dancing. Most of the extant music, believed to be dance music, is found in two 15th century dance treatises. The earliest is an untitled manuscript in the Bibliothèque Royale Brussels that is known to have been owned by the court of Burgundy at the same time that they had a regularly employed Alta Ensemble. The other, Michael Toulouse's L'Art et Instruction des Bien Danseurs, is the earliest extant published dance manual and is believed to be from approximately 1480. Both manuscripts provide dance steps along with the monophonic tenors. The authors of these treatises wrote that the music is played in more than one part and the dancers are to know the tenor part and synchronize their steps with it. It is widely agreed that the members of an alta ensemble had memorized many tenor parts. However, scholars debate the origin of the superiors and contratenor parts. 
Possible practices for the origin of these parts include extemporization, memorization of pre-composed music, or a combination of the two. Evidence that supports the view that the Alta Ensemble extemporized dance music includes iconography, a section of Tinctoris's Liber de Arte Contrapunti, and the previ previously mentioned dance manuals that include only tenor parts. While there is much iconography that shows musicians, especially vocalists, reading music, to my knowledge, the Alta Ensemble is never shown with music. This absence of music supports both the idea that the musicians are extemporizing and the idea that they are playing pre-composed -compo pre music from memory. However, it does not prove either theory. The passage from Tintoris's treatise provides a stronger argument for extemporization. He differentiates between composed counterpoints and counterpoint done mentally. He states that in composed counterpoint, all parts are dependent on each other. That is, each part is consonant not only with the tenor, but with all the other parts as well. In counterpoint done mentally, each voice is consonant with the tenor, but not necessarily with the other voices. He also states that it is laudable if those who perform counterpoint done mentally make agreements beforehand that would allow for consonance between all voices. This implies that some 15th century alta ensembles extemporized counterpoints without regard to dissonance between the superiors and contratenor parts. It also implies that some ensembles made agreements before playing that allowed them to avoid such dissonance, indicating that such a performance was not completely extemporized. Keith Polk, in his book German Instrumental Music of the Late Middle Ages, describes ways in which the musicians might have been able to extemporize and avoid dissonance between all parts. His method, however, does not consist of pure extemporization and performance. Rather, it depends upon agreements made between the musicians before playing. This includes the cadential formulas found in Andreas Ornithoparchus's treatise Musicae Active Micrologus, published in Leipzig in 1517. It is also possible that the Alta musicians had pre-composed tenor parts memorized, as well as a note-against-note version of the superiors and contratenor parts. The Sham player then would make the superiors part more florid by adding notes to the note-against-note note structure they had memorized. A diary written by the trumpeter Zortzi around the turn of the 15th century includes many tenor parts for use with the, with the tenor of, I'm sorry, includes many contratenor parts for use with the tenor of John Dunstable's Puisque Mamor. It is not known if these are pre-existent contratenor parts written by someone else and then memorized and written by Zorsi, or if this is an example of a trumpet player practicing the art of composing contratenor parts. However, because these contratenors have not been identified in another manuscript, because they are in what is believed to be Zorsi's writing, and because they are idiomatically written for the slide trumpet, they are thought to have been composed by Zorsi. As was mentioned earlier, it can be difficult to move the trumpet quickly from first to fourth position, as well as from fourth to first position. In general, awkward movements between slide positions are avoided more in Zorsi's contratenor parts than in those of other composers. This manuscript also provides strong evidence that the trumpet at the turn of the 15th century was equipped with a slide and that it served as the contratenor instrument in the Alta Ensemble. We will now play Dunstable's Puisque Mamor with the contratenor parts from Zorzi's diary.
previously mentioned dance manuals do not necessarily indicate that the superiors and contratenor parts were extemporized. Both authors state that the music for dancing is played in more than one part. I believe that they included only the tenor because that is the part to which the dance steps relate. In his article, Hoftans and Bossa Dance, Daniel Hertz points out that some of the dance tenors included in these manuals are adaptations of tenor parts from similarly titled chansons. He makes no mention, however, of the possibility that an ensemble played the chanson that is implied by both the tenor and its accompanying title. It is possible that the Alta Ensemble played the compositions of others and memorized these works for performance. Thus, the iconography shows them without music. Herbert Myers explored the Alta Ensemble's possible memorization of repertoire in his DMA paper, Musical Resources of the 15th Century Sham Band. He wrote that memorization is implied in written reports, and records for the city of Bruges in 1484 show that a payment was made for composing and compiling of motets that are to be performed by the city's Alta Ensemble. In summary, it is my opinion that we can be fairly confident of the existence of the slide trumpet and its use as the contratenor instrument in the Alta Ensemble by at least the early 15th century. It seems probable that the ensemble memorized the music of contemporary composers and transposed the music to suit the ranges of their instruments. Documentation also indicates that they might have extemporized or partially extemporized music that contained the same sophisticated counterpoint that is found in the written compositions of the time. I will conclude with the performance of John Bennett's Telus Purpurium, after which I will take questions.
wants to know why it was called the Alta Ensemble. Um, the first time it was called the Alta Ensemble was by Tinctoris, and he, when he describes the instruments, he talks. I, I talked about the shawm and what he said about the shawm. In that same passage, he says that when the shawms and a brass player play together, it is called alta. So that's his term, and I guess that's just that's why we use the term today. That's the earliest use of the term that, that I know of. And we have no other context for that term that you know of. That's the only source for that term. No, there's no, I, I mean, you, yeah. we can speculate on why it, why it would be called the Alta Ensemble. Can you speculate? Um, I, my opinion would be that it's the high ensemble. They play high, they transpose the music into a higher, a higher range generally than what it, it's written for the ranges of the instruments. Um, and Alta yeah. would mean high, so yeah. it would make sense to me that it would be called the, the high ensemble, the, and that that would have made sense to Tinctoris. Okay, I was wondering, if, uh, the music, does, it, does the notation, or the, what, the instrument, what the players are playing from, does that prescribe certain instruments, or is it obvious that it must be for certain instruments by the nature of the music? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, his question is, does the, does the music specify what instruments or is it just are intended? Uh, no, it does not. Um, no. So, <laughs> So the music, the pieces that you chose, how did you come to choose them? And do we, do we know that the, was it intended for the ensemble that you're playing, or you just, it, it's something that you can just do? Why did I choose the music yeah. that, that I chose? Yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, well. <laughs> I think that the music is appropriate for, for the ensemble. I think that any music would have been appropriate for the ensemble. Like I stated at the beginning of the paper, there are arguments whether a piece was, was I mean, even if there are lyrics, if it could only be uh, intended for vocalists. There are pieces that include parts are that, that have no text. Is there text? Two of, the pieces we, yeah. two of the pieces we played today had no text. Um, those were the, the pieces out of the Trent manuscript. Um, the two that we started with, there is text. Um, there's not text through the whole through the whole um, um, piece. That's why we played the pieces three times because they're because of the stand stanzas of text. Um, does okay. that answer? Okay. What? Yeah. <laughs> also, I was wondering, do we have extant instruments from these periods that, in which case, they would help establish pitch? norms, right? Because the fixed trumpet, it doesn't change, right? Right. Do we have extant instruments? No. No? Not at all? No. There's an extant slide trumpet. The earliest one, is, the extant slide trumpet is from 1651. So it's much later. And it is in D. Hmm. I think that the, sh the, the, the shawms, uh, with their, their length and their um, I mean, I don't know as much about the shawm as, as the trumpet, but um, <laughs> I think that, uh, okay. thank you, um, that with the finger holes on the shawm, that there's just practical limitations to, to how long the shawm could be. Um, I'm curious, why would a person choose to play these instruments? I mean, if you play this music on a modern trumpet with valves, it's a lot easier, right? Is it a lot easier or not? No? Uh, yeah, I mean, if it was transposed into a range where I could play it on, on a modern trumpet, of course it, 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 be easier, it would, would be easier. But so is the sound somehow inherently different so that it makes playing these instruments worthwhile? Absolutely. The sound is completely different. If we were going to pr play this in a modern, with modern instruments, I guess I would play a, uh, a trumpet half the length of this trumpet, right. and um, so we have a different timbre, a, a completely different timbre, and then we would be playing with maybe oboes and an English horn. <laughs> so in other words, to be as authentic as possible in the sound. The I don't think that sound. you could create. I don't think that you could even begin to create the, the 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 sound with modern instruments. Is it very difficult to play these instruments? It sounds like it's difficult. <laughs> like it's, I mean. 
yet you're doing everything with your lips, right? You're, you're getting the right pitches by, except on the slide trumpet, but on the fixed instruments. Correct. It's with your lips. Correct. So does that take a long time to learn how to do? Is it, is it difficult to do? I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and because you're playing higher in the you're, you're playing higher in the overtone series as the as the overtone series gets higher, the notes get closer together. Uh, and because on especially on the fixed instrument, you're playing very high in the overtone series, your chances of missing notes are much more likely than than on a valved instrument where you're generally playing lower in the overtone series. So does one who plays these instruments have to spend a lot of time practicing just to? I, I practice on the on the um, on the baroque trumpet, the the non with the one without a slide right. every day, yeah. every day. I don't practice the modern trumpet every day, <laughs> um, but, but I find that by practicing the baroque trumpet every day. Um, it's easier I can still play the modern trumpet. Right. If I were to practice the modern trumpet every day, it would not be so easy for me to, to play the Baroque trumpet. Yeah. Yes? I'm just wondering, um, you may very well be right, um, but on a much more prescribed scale, there really is quite a bit of evidence in terms of also a vocal improvised practice. I'm thinking, for example, there's really almost a proof text in one of the York Wakefield plays, which is contemporary with what you do with Corpus Christi plays, uh, which is seasonal. It has to do with the shepherds having seen the angel. And uh, they say to one another, one says, you take the tenor, Sam, or whoever, and I'll take a fourth above and a third below, and you take a third below. Well, of course, it's discounted. It's and that strikes me as something that probably was, there are many other instances of this mm -hmm. in various, uh, various contexts, but this would parallel uh, improvised vocal polyphony, but on a very prescribed scale. Because the, one of the problems that I see, for example, is that the musica ficta practice of the 15th century, this music that you were dealing with, is really very limited in terms of, of chromatic notes, obviously. Right. And so you don't need all of these possibilities that you do have on the slide trumpet. But the three together, the texture of the three together, is really a very important texture that would, be, would, would correspond perfectly to this practice of this kind of use, which apparently was, and you played in the, in the midst of um, some of your pieces, you played several sections of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just, um, I'm just uh, ruminating about this. You're a very provocative lecture, which I'm doing very much. I'm just ruminating about this, looking in terms of, of a parallel between vocal polyphony, improvised vocal polyphony, that is using more or less the same ranges mm -hmm. and would employ, well, I'm not, I'm not saying it would employ the same technique, obviously not, but that one could very well play um, with, the Alta Ensemble. This improvised, for example, this improvised um, passage uh, would have had no text. Mm -hmm. It's not texted in the New York Wakefield. Um, so that okay. might be an interesting source to kind of rummage around. It, it would be. And what is it? What is the title of it again? Well, they're, they're the cycle of York Wakefield play from the, from the city of, of York uh, from the 15th century anonymous. For, for the Corpus Christi uh, plays, okay. which are readily available. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. My question has to do with the manuscript sources we have for the music. Mm -hmm. How is it notated? Or is it in any kind of tour form, or is it just like parts of the play? Uh, I believe that all of the pieces we played, uh, they're, they're in parts. So there would be the superior part, the tenor part, and, and the contratenor part. But are they different parts both as opposed to? You know, no, they're next to each other, but not in score form. So there's one, not one on, not one on, so there would not be. They're not vertically aligned. They're not vertically aligned. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And where, where are the sources? 
Um, I have that written down. If, I'm sorry? Yeah, I, ha I have that written down. I can look that and look that up. Um, that we played are um, in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, Bo Bodleian. Um, the, um, I'm not sure of the source, the source for the Dunstable, the, the Zortzi manuscript that that I have, which is the contratenor parts that I played with that piece, are in um, the British Library. Um, the manuscript is, is in the British Library. And um, I guess I didn't write down the source for the last piece either. Sorry. Yes? I'm a little interested in the technology. I don't know if you know. Uh, is this the first slide brass instrument? It would be. Yeah. Yes. And what what issues went into did anybody talk about? You know, poor, poor guy developing probably was never known. But I wonder if they talked about why it took a while and what were the issues that went into slide sliding tones and so on. That must have been a different feeling from the key, you know, the hands. Sure. I think with the. Um Trouble players were playing with Sean players before the development of the slide, but obviously the notes were very limited. Um, and as the as the music changed, the desire to be able to play um, to play in more notes um, was apparent. And so I think that they were just trying to figure out how how to best do this. One more question. All right, somebody back. Yeah. Yes. How how uh, wide would you say the practice is of the alt ensemble in today's early music uh, movement, and uh, how widely practiced do you think the slide trumpet is within Baroque trumpet? I, I think that there is. Medieval and Renaissance music being being performed. Um, I think that in the whole big picture of early music performance, I think that it's small um, compared to how many Baroque orchestras there are, for example. Um, the slide trumpet would would be even uh, even smaller. I don't know um, when I first got this instrument and started. <laughs> trying to figure out the music and the playing, which was um, uh, just in September. <laughs> uh, I ended up getting in contact with um, uh, tribal players on the East Coast. And they're the only ones that I have, have, um, have found in the United States that play the slide trumpet in medieval uh, in Renaissance, in, in an alta ensemble, would be the two players on the, on the East Coast. Sad. It is sad. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to add one more question. I brought this my last one. <laughs> you can go back to one of your brother's illustrations, right? Mm -hmm. 
the one with the black background with notation on the front. I'm curious how that's how one reads that notation. The manuscript. Is it uh, no. the dance manuscript? Can you, I'll just go back one or two. It's not a modern staff, but there are, yeah. there are lines to the notes. The rhythm is, is a problem. And all of the, the, all of the um, because these are tenor parts with the, the dance, the thought is that these are just equal notes. So there, measure, is not, one measure, one. there is not rhythm um, here. So what do, do, we have, do we have names for the pitches or what? I see a clef, right? Yeah, so that would be a C clef. And um, so the line so in the, the middle of it would be C. And so, and then there are words, right? Those are the dance steps. Those are not words. Those are those are dance steps. Oh, I see. Okay. And then under that, what is that? Under the white letters. Those are dance dance steps. Wait. So we have something. We have text in orange, right? There are two. There are the, two different colored lines of right. containing characters. Right? It looks like text in orange. That's oh, correct. the text would be would be the tenor, right? Okay. And the the white is the dance steps. The dance steps, yes. Which are S's and and oh, B's okay. and there are there's a key to what these steps. Okay. So abbreviations. Yeah, they're abbreviations. Okay, thank you. Yes. On a modern trombone, they do a lot of slide, uh, changing the sound. I wondered if there's any uh, anything in the, this period in which they're not trying to hit the note. I'm not sure. What, okay. But changing the changing the pitch. Well, you uh, like you said, like bending the notes and so on. Uh, jazz, you know, they do quite a bit. I almost wondered if they had you know, any tradition of, of using the slide. That must have been obvious when they were practicing that you had these different sounds out of the instrument. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, they could, bend, they could bend notes, and they would do that, for example, the, the B flat that shows up periodically, but actually not, not often, not often at all. Um, but I don't think they, they would not have been using techniques like jazz players would be today. Maybe, maybe practicing or something. <laughs> With these examples out of the dance manuals, uh, out of the discipline of dance, do you think that um, rhythmic patterns can be uh, at least suggested based on the dance pattern? Rhythmic patterns here? I think from, from what I've read uh, regarding this particular manuscript is that those uh, the, the point is for those notes to not be rhythmic, and so, so that the dance players know know when they, they know the tenor, they know when to perform the steps. But I'm not really I I, I wouldn't say that for sure. Um, so the melody. I mean, they could they could play. Um, I suppose they could have. Rhythm, for example, when I when I uh, mentioned in my paper that the possibility is some of these, it, it's been noted that some of these tenors are tenors that we know from, and ti they're given the same title in the manuscript. So that tenor would have rhythm, and I suppose the dancers would have known the tenor part, and right, then knowing popular, where to put the dance a steps. Tune or something, right? right, right. So they would have known maybe what the rhythm. Right. Right. Yes. When you uh, went to prepare this music, did you have to transcribe the music, <laughs> or is it available in an edition somewhere or online? It, it, it is available. I did not transcribe any of it. Is it on online? Or I didn't find it online. The, the pieces that I chose, uh, I really, um, because I was 
just learning the instrument, I, I, I really went to the library and looked for things that I thought I could play. So. <laughs> That's the real answer. <laughs> That's the real answer. <laughs> and, and would be suitable for the, the shaman bombard, obviously. In terms of what range? Range, in terms of range. Are there any other questions? Thank you for coming. <laughs>